Um, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Wolf's Alp uh, project for inspiring so much interest and um, to organizing this uh, conference in this wonderful venue. I also would like to thank Luigi to get the Large Carnivore Initiative crowd here. Um, and also for setting the frame basically for, for today. My talk is on mapping uh, large carnivores in Europe. Um, and I didn't put all the courses on my slide because basically this et al includes all the members of the large carnivore initiative, a lot of which are sitting in the uh, audience and will also give presentations today. But you ha can multiply that number by at least another five for each of the members to acknowledge also their colleagues who are working on this. And then multiply it by a hundred or even a thousand to acknowledge all the people that are going out in the field to collect that data. And I suppose quite a few of those are sitting in the audience today, which are working on the Wolf's Alp uh, project. Um, so uh, the maps and um, you have probably seen these large carnivore distribution maps um, quite a bit and you will see them more today. Um, the Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe attempted a first Europe-wide uh, mapping of the large carnivore distribution in 2004-2005. Um, we did an update of this mapping um, for the period 2006 to 2011, and um, this is these maps here on the, on the screen. It was the first attempt to get a kind of a comprehensive uh, overview. It was done for the uh, European Commission. Um, but we also then used these maps to publish them and kind of make them av uh, available for a wider audience. Um, because actually this recovery of large carnivores in Europe, um, well, we are familiar with this and we know we have these species here, but I'm working, for example, a lot in Central Asia. And there is quite this uh, perception that while well, Europe is a cultural uh, landscape, basically, and we are famous for our cities, for our art, but not necessarily for wild animals like large carnivores. And um, for them, it's actually very important to see these maps and also for North American colleagues. And we could show that there was a remarkably uh, recovery of all four species. And this is the kind of the distribution of the species at their kind of historic lows in the 1950s, 1970s. And if you compare this with what it looked in 2012, um, there has been a remarkable gain. And I mean, we have heard already from Luigi, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of problems, but on the, on the large scale, we actually have uh, made a lot of, uh, uh, we see a lot of success, so there is a recovery. And um, I think it's also good for us working with large carnivores to, um, to show this because um, there are so many challenges and, and issues to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that sometimes we forget the, the bigger picture that actually, yes, we are making some progress. <clears throat> this progress is due largely to a change in the society, so it's a different attitude. We have decided we want these species back. We have created the legislational framework to make this possible. And we have put an interest in there, and um, the, the interest the European uh, Commission is giving the species and also providing the funds for the various uh, life project is a very important uh, prerequisite to make this recovery happen. And this map you see here running in the background also shows you that Yes, Europe is very densely settled, but there's also an urbanization happening, so there's more of a concentration of people in the cities, and we are also uh, recovering our forests. So the forest cover now is much higher than it has been in the past. So also the, the habitat in a lot of places has become much more favorable for these uh, large carnivore uh, species. Um, and the other thing is that the prey population have dramatically recovered um, and we probably have densities of ungulates in large parts of Europe which have never been at these 
densities and provide uh, prey for lynx and wolf and to a certain degree also for, for bears. So basically, why map large carnivores? Um, well, it's, these maps are together with images like from this Wild Wonders of Europe uh, approach, um, they, they can tell a very powerful message that it's actually possible to live with these large carnivores if you decide you want that. It's, a, it's largely a society uh, decision because luckily uh, these large carnivores are fairly flexible in where they can live, yes. They are largely associated with forests, but as the picture that Luigi showed before, for the, the wolves in Spain, um, well, if you let them, they can also live in agricultural uh, landscapes and in fields. Um, these maps also provide a reality check on the, on the status because you can actually put it on, on a map. Um, me being from Germany, um, telling that there is actually wolves in Germany is for a lot of people is a, is a huge surprise because they associate wolves with Scandinavia and the vast uh, forests um, there. And they don't actually realize we have these animals in, in Central Europe. Um, it's an important, these maps are also an important um, planning um, tool for, for management basically to show where are the animals present, where are conflicts, where are opportunities. They also show us if our conservation uh, approaches are working or not working. They help us to um, focus our monitoring uh, effects on areas where Maybe there is white uh, uh, holes in the map, and so it's, it's important to check more closely if these animals are present. Um, and if we find they are not, then we might consider that we have to put more funds to recover them, or we have to decide that it's not possible to have them there. It's also important to focus research, and then lately especially also to focus um, edu educational information campaigns and public outreach because people that live in areas where large carnivores are recovering need a different type of information than those that have been living with these large carnivores for the last centuries or where they have never disappeared. Um, we decided to do an update of the 2012 uh, um, map and um, we included, we um, did again the, the brown bear, Eurasian lynx, the wolf, the wolverine, and we added the Iberian lynx and the golden jackal. And on the golden jackal, there will be a talk by Nathan Runs um, later the day. Um, the spatial extent of the mapping includes the EU countries plus Switzerland and Norway, and we also uh, included now Belarus and Ukraine. The time period, like I said, is 2012 to 2016, and the kind of the unit we are mapping is this 10 by 10 uh, EU um, grid. Um, presence, we, for this presentation, I just use uh, two uh, categories, which is a permanent presence, so where over a couple of years the presence of the carnivore uh, could be confirmed or where you had signs of reproduction and then a sporadic range where there's more fluctuations in the, in the presence and no signs of reproduction uh, yet or anymore. Uh, for compiling uh, these maps, um, you assume in an ideal world that the monitoring program hasn't changed, that the, massing, the mapping methods has, uh, have stayed the same, and that basically also the, the monitoring effort um, has stayed the same. Unfortunately, we are not living in an ideal world, um, but keep in mind this is a Europe-wide, uh, so a continent-scale uh, overview. Um, it's also, as Dr. Notario also uh, pointed out in the talk earlier, that um, there's a lot of transboundary uh, populations, but the harmonization in the monitoring and the mapping between the different countries is not necessarily given, or only in a, in a few rare cases. Um, and so for this mapping purpose, what I did for the cells in the border areas, if one country said there's a permanent presence and the neighboring country said there's a sporadic presence, then I, I just used the higher category. So I then basically the, the permanent presence wins over the sporadic, just so to understand what I did. 
Um, this is the, the coverage. Um, like I said, we included um, Belarus and Ukraine, um, but I haven't been able to totally integrate it into the maps yet. I also want to point out that all these maps we are showing there today, they are preliminary maps. We have a workshop of the next two days where we have to discuss quite a few of these state details on the, on the maps. But it's, um, again, uh, focus on the, on the bigger picture. Um, starting with the new species, the Iberian uh, lynx, that was actually fairly easy to, um, to do the mapping because there is a large EU-funded um, project, the Iber lynx uh, project, which is monitoring Iberian lynx presence on a one by one kilometer grid since 2003. Um, you see this on the uh, left panel there. And um, basically what we then did is convert these one by one kilometer cells to a 10 by 10. <laughs> well, on the, on the right side um, um, grid. And what is very clear in this population, um, it's increasing, um, which is due to reintroduction, but also to reproduction in the wild of these reintroduced um, cats. So that's certainly a, a success story there, which was urgently needed since the Iberian lynx was in, in pretty bad shape. Um, the next is the, uh, the wolverine, a large carnivore species, which is only found in uh, Northern Europe. So uh, covering, um, Norway, Sweden, and, and Finland. Um, on the left panel is the uh, maps from the, the previous uh, mapping exercise. And on the right panel is the uh, updated uh, map. If you look, you see that it's, it's looking pretty similar. And just from the cell counts, the, the, the range hasn't really uh, changed much. So it seems to be a more or less constant uh, 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 range. Um, there's a bit of a win in Finland and probably a little bit of a less, uh, loss in Sweden. Um, if we look at the population development over the last years, it also suggests that it is more or less stable. There are some fluctuations, which also has a bit to do with the uh, monitoring effort and with the uh, snow conditions. So the wolverine is um, at least uh, stable. Coming to the next species, which is the wolf, that's the most dynamic of the large carnivore species in Europe with the most change in the, in the range. Um, again, on the left, the old map, on the uh, right side, the, the new one. Um, there appears to be an increase in the permanent range. Um, this has, is largely due to changes in Scandinavia, as you can see. And then it's also the increase in the uh, Polish, German, uh, French population, and also some increase in, in the Alpine population. So that increase is probably uh, uh, true, not a method cost increase. So here you see the increase in the Scandinavian, in the number of packs, and also in Germany, a uh, pretty dramatic increase. And if you look, the number of packs in Scandinavia and Germany is uh, actually Germany now has more packs than Scandinavia, which is for a lot of people kind of hard to imagine. Um, but for the Scandinavian uh, layer, there is also a bit of a change in how the maps are done, so which causes a bit of a, a bit more uh, positive uh, range there. But generally, wolves are gaining range clearly and. The brown bear, um, the same thing again, the old uh, distribution map and the new one on the, the right. Again, it appears that the uh, permanent range of the bear is, is increasing. Um, there has, uh, uh, however, also been a change in the, um, in the methods. So there is a different um, Buffer being used in Finland, so this looks more uh, as a, a bigger permanent range now than it, it probably uh, is in reality, which has to do, like, like I said, with a method. But then you also uh, gain, like for example, the, the bears in, in the Italian 
uh, Alps. So again, it's a positive trend we see there, and this positive trend is a real uh, trend. <clears throat> um, the situation for the Eurasian links is the following. Again, um, it appears that the um, permanent range has increased, um, which has to do with an increase in um, especially Scandinavia, and then also with reintroduced population, for example, in Germany, the Harz population, and then a new reintroduction in the Palatine forest, and then generally a slight increase in several of the existing um, populations. There's a bit of question mark about the um, the method, the mapping method for Finland. Something has changed there because the number hasn't increased that much. Um, and we have no details for um, Slovakia at the moment. And Latvia looks a bit more um, uh, gappy now, which has to do that also, well, climate change is having an effect on uh, monitoring methods, so the snow conditions aren't that reliable anymore. And for uh, the updated map, there's only two years of snow tracking in there, so that makes it look different. And this shows you already a little bit the pitfalls of such a large-scale uh, mapping approach, so the, the, the devil is a bit in the, in the details here. Um, so, the challenges of such a large-scale uh, mapping are things like climatic conditions in situations where you are monitoring mass depends heavily on snow tracking, which is the case especially in the, in the northern and the Baltic uh, countries. Um, then, it, it, like I said before, it also depends on the method you use, so there's increasingly being more modern methods um, used, which also then change a bit um, the picture, so change, you, you move from maybe only accepting livestock damages to a more robust ones that you want to have, like genetic proof or camera trap images. Um, any map you produce depends on the effort you put in there. So if nobody went to that place, you can't really put it on the map because you don't know if the, pres if the, pred the, the carnivore is present. It depends on the, on the training and the experience of your uh, monitoring uh, personnel. It also depends on which signs you accept as proof of carnivore presence and how much quality control and documentation of these signs you require. It depends on how long your monitoring period is. Uh, ideally, we were covering the period from 2012 to 2016, but like I pointed out, well, if the snow conditions are not given in a year, you can't really produce the data, so you might have a shorter time period, or you don't have the funding to cover the entire country, or you only have funding to do one year of monitoring. Um, and then the next um, level which is influencing what your map looks like is basically your mapping uh, methods. So it's the rules you are using, and particularly um, because not in all countries it was possible to cover the entire range, so you depend on some kind of extrapolation uh, using expert assessment to fill in gaps or using buffers to account for the fact that a carnivore is uh, moving over a larger area. And if you change these rules, your maps look, look different. And then also these harmonization rules between um, neighboring countries. So basically what do you do with the cells you share and how do you uh, uh, categorize them? And I don't want to go in any of these uh, details because that's some of the things we have to kind of uh, discuss among us. But um, just to show what, it, what consequences it has if you use different buffers. For example, here's a scenario where the red dot um, shows where you actually have a carnivore sign. A, let's assume it's a GPS coordinate. And so um, if you're very restrict restrictive, then only that cell around the point becomes uh, categorized as uh, having carnivore presence. But if you use a buffer, then you end up with at least one 
Well, if it's not exactly in the middle of the cell, you have maybe one neighboring cell or more likely three neighboring cells you also call occupied. Or you have a rule where you say you use the adjacent uh, cells and you can say you use the full cells and you get four or you use all adjacent cells and you have already eight cells around that one point which you call that is carnivore presence. And then we also still have countries where the information uh, is coming on the level of, for example, hunting grounds or municipalities, which normally is in those countries where there is um, hunting of the large carnivores or where damage statistics are the main uh, data um, we are using for defining presence. Then, for example, one, one bear shot in a certain place might suddenly uh, fill 21 cells with his presence. So, and it's, it's a bit the, the challenge to put all these different levels of mapping and information and exploration, uh, extrapolation into, into one map. Ideally, where we want to come is something like that, where um, you can define, and I'm using here just an example for the links in, in uh, Macedonia, where you say, okay, that was in gray here, the, the area we surveyed and we assumed a uh, large carnivore presence in the previous monitoring period. We go back, we uh, assess the whole area again, uh, we find evidence only in these red uh, cells. Um, we categorize them as sporadic, permanent, and now we also included uh, reproduction. Um, but because um, our effort was so limited and um, we weren't able to do long-term or longer-term monitoring, we also assume that the previous range is still valid, so we add this too, and then we might also decide we um, buffer some of the cells, so we end up with the third uh, map. And um, for one thing, it's, that's possible to do it like this, but it's important that we are able to kind of reconstruct how we came to these maps, and that it's always done the same way to be really able to say, um, can we see change and what is assumed presence and what is really proved presence. So that's ba basically where we want to go there. We are not there yet because it's a continental wide uh, mapping approach and there's a lot of details, but that's kind of where we are heading to eventually. Um, another issue with the, with the mapping is also the uh, population delineation, basically where does one population stop, where does the next one start. Um, this is actually a, 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 a problem which is new, which is caused by the, the recovery of the species, so it's actually a luxury uh, problem. And um, like, for example, with the wolves, we originally defined these 10 population, which had to do with administrational borders and kind of practical uh, reasons also to uh, delineate them. Well, the map looks, looks different now that these populations are merging. Um, there is exchange of individuals and there can be uh, different definitions or different approaches on saying, well, what do we want to call a definition, uh, a population? How do we com combine them? But um, if we want to give range on a population level basis, then it matters where we draw the, the borders. So we don't have a final answer for this yet. It's up for discussion. So I'm just putting this out here that this is also an issue which, which comes up with this, with this mapping. Um, also, one word of caution with these maps. These maps cannot be translated into population numbers. So you cannot extrapolate from an area to the size of the population because for one thing we have a gradient from north to south in the size of the, of the ranges these animals have. And it also depends on the, on the status of, of these population. You can have a, a very low density population with animals that are moving far uh, around just to find uh, pairs and then you get, the, get a large range um, but you have a very low density. Um, yeah, so that's basically the summary of the mapping and um, this is also an alternative version of doing the mapping. 